This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 878, recorded on March 18th, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello there, Vincent and everybody else. Um, I don't have to look out the window to tell you what kind of day it is. It is probably the best day of the year so far. It's about 70 degrees. There's a light breeze. I wish this podcast were an outdoor podcast today. To like sit <laughs> around and sort of share drinks and stories and stuff like this. But uh, here it is, and it's it's actually quite wonderful out there. Is Good it to be alive. fair to say that uh, winter is over? No, I wouldn't go that far. It snowed no. like hell yesterday. We had snow yesterday in Fort Lee, New Jersey, off and on all day long. Oh, that's and today it goes up to seventy. So this year it rained. You've got well, it rained here too, and it, then it, the sun came out, then this, then another front came through. It was quite dramatic, actually. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. 65 degrees and sunny and very windy. Ah. Uh, I think winter is over. Mm. That is, I don't anticipate another freeze. It would be, it's improbable at this point. Um, this is actually potentially the nicest time of the year before it gets really hot. Right. We got another uh, uh, so couple true. months here, maybe. Yeah, Michael Warby said we're leaving the 70s behind after today, mostly. Yeah, uh, yeah those, uh, the Arizona is about 10 degrees ahead of us, typically. Right. Also joining us from New York, Amy Rosenfeld. Hello, Amy. Hello. How are you? Good. Okay. How you? How's the weather up there? <laughs> it's fine. It's blue skies, clouds. I'm just trying to figure out where the snow was yesterday that Dixon's talking about. Well, they were on the roofs of cars. They were actually, I look out my window and there's a school across the street. And five minutes before it happened, the cars all looked normal. I looked out again and everything had a white crest on it. And then that- 20 minutes later, it was gone. Oh. I guess I, I guess I must have been at the tish, at the mouth house during that hour. Crazy, Steve. Yeah, well, that's right. That's right. So today we have two non-COVID papers. Now every, I can hear everyone shutting the door and leaving. <laughs> because Tuesday we had a, this is a two-week episode. Actually three. We're going to do Daniels tonight. But um, uh, two-week episode week. And uh, this is your non-COVID episode for those of you who like to learn about other virology and our first, our snippet actually no, is not about viruses. It's about right. prions, prions, infectious proteins that, so prion is a protein that can change shape and do something completely different. And they exist in many organisms, but in mammals, they can be pathogenic and they can cause prion diseases like transmissible and transmissible spongy form encephalopathies in humans, uh, in cows, mad cow disease, uh, in mink, many other uh, animals as well, scrapie in sheep and goats, Kreutzfeldt, Jakob, and Kuru in humans. And there's a new one that's been discovered uh, rather recently. Uh, It is chronic wasting disease a prion disease of cervids, deer, elk, moose. And as of January 2020, the disease CWD has been found in both free-ranging and farmed cervids in 26 U.S. states and three Canadian provinces. So these are diseases that can be transmitted by protein. So, for example... If you ate contaminated beef uh, in the UK at the time of the BSE outbreak, uh, the prions, the misfolded proteins, which are a misfolded version of a protein that's uh, in the host, can somehow get into your brain and, and cause your prions to misfold. And then you get a chronic degenerative neurological disease, uh, which progresses over many years and eventually kills you because we don't have any therapies. And so 
the fact that many deer are getting this is a is concerning at multiple levels because people hunt deer, right? They and eat they them. Eat them. They and, do. Um, so, so far, no hunters have gotten a, a prion disease from deer, although maybe it's a long incubation period. Who knows, right? So, Vincent, in these deer farms, and I've seen many of them out west, uh, when they find it in the herd, what do they do? That's a good question. I don't know. Because they're, you know, the they're selling the meat. They probably yeah, I don't... call them De Dixon. Well, yeah, you think they call the herd? Yeah. I would think so that they call the herd. That's what they do in England when they have animals. Oh, understood, but um, there's no evidence that it transmits between deer and people. And there's a lot of uh, anecdotal evidence that that's yeah. already been tried. So they could say, well, in this case, you don't get it like mad cow disease. Mad deer disease doesn't exist in people. <laughs> that's do true, but do you want to take the risk? Well, that's what I'm asking. Do they take the risk or are they obliged to report it even? Uh, do we know whether this is uh, actually an emerging disease or whether it is an emerging uh, awareness? Yeah, I don't think good we idea. know. It's a okay. That's a good question. Good I mean, so, well, as far as I know, it's an emerging disease because the prion in the animal exhibits behavioral changes that would have been noticed right away if they had um, hunters, for instance, would find these deer very easy to shoot because they don't move very well. Yeah, yeah. And so they, I think this is a recent uh, it could be. emergence. Now, so or the hunter would have noticed that they don't move properly and not sh yeah. and choose not to shoot the deer because yeah. it's already diseased, right? Or they shot it and they didn't take it home. You right. shot it because you put it out of its misery. That's true. And then you just left the carcass because why would you take something home that you thought was... Uh, dying be, to begin with. Right? You would be surprised. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to try try on a couple of background things. Keep a, um, you know, correct me if I screw up here. But first of all, the protein involved, the prion protein, is a um, a normal component mm -hmm. of uh, you know tissues in uh, basically all mammals, as far as right, I know, right, and maybe. Right, yeah. Uh, specifically expressed in nervous tissue of unknown function. Okay. Right, as far right. as I can see, you can make uh, knockout mice and they are, uh, they are pretty much normal. So there's a uh, lingering debate over exactly what this thing does. Uh, and then the path, the pathology is that the normal protein can misfold, as I think has already been said, uh, and the misfolded protein, that this, one of the things I, uh, well, I forget where I read it, but it may be in this uh, paper, uh, describing these proteins as um, intrinsically disordered, okay, which is near and dear to my heart because I worked on a, a intrinsically disordered protein for a while. These are, in theory at least, prone to what's called induced fit, where you have a protein that doesn't have uh, a real rigid structure, and when it uh, binds to another protein, uh, mm -hmm. the conformation of the protein that it's binding to induces the disordered protein to uh, assume a particular config uh, configuration. So that's an induced fit. And the way I see this is that these proteins can spontaneously misfold, and when they do, that serves as a template so that when another disordered version of the same protein interacts with that, it will misfold to match that misfolded protein. Well, it just keeps and piling up, right? It keeps piling up, and you can get these amyloid uh, deposits, which are thought to be uh, part of the uh, pathogenesis. Right. So the question, and so if from that point of view, it's infectious from the point of view that you can take a a misfolded protein from a sheep that's uh, diseased and inject it into another sheep that's normal, mm -hmm, but the right. presence of the misfolded protein causes the normal protein to misfold in that uh, infected sheep. And so that uh, a sheep gets sick. These can also be transmitted among, uh, among members of these species like sheep, uh, I guess, uh, orally, mostly you uh, eat it um, and it winds up um, uh, 
transmitting disease. So it's a transmissible spongiform encephalopathy. Your brain is not right. Spongiform is, there's no accident about the nature of that word. Your brain looks like a sponge. It's got and are we right in so assuming in. that when you eat a piece of meat that's been well cooked, it doesn't matter because it can still do uh, it? That's not necessarily true because uh, these things are really resistant to all sorts of yeah, uh, right. uh, insults, uh, chemical and physical and otherwise. Um, though, in fact, the uh, uh, you make a good point because Okay, so let me come back to that, uh, Dixon. Sure. Uh, another thing here is, so the question becomes, um, can you transmit this from one species to another? Exactly. Well, okay. before we get to that, I mean, isn't it bizarre that it, you eat it, it goes through the stomach, and it, it survives, survives the pH yeah. and of, of the stomach and isn't Pepsin, digested right. into single amino acids uh, like well, any other pr pr protein that you eat is? Yeah, except that, you know, one of the ways you, one of the ways to, quote, purify, the air quotes, purify uh, these proteins is to subject them to really uh, rigorous protease treatment and about the only thing that survives, and I don't think it's the whole particle, is the prion. Right. They're really, uh, they're uh, quite protease resistant for, exactly. for reasons that I don't particularly understand. They're also resistant to heat and all sorts of other things. I think in order, this is one of the uh, reasons, uh, one of the dangers is uh, transmission in surgical procedures, okay? Mm -hmm. yes. uh, because uh, just autoclaving doesn't do the trick. Correct. You have to like soak the instruments in uh, concentrated That's sodium correct. hydroxide or right. something like that. But that's like then saying RNA is a prion because it survives autoclaving and stuff. That's why uh, you know well, RNAs <laughs> some, are not good. Why some, working some, in the yeah. RNAs? Some are, RNAs, is, some go go RNAs is do survive. <laughs> some RNAs is do survive, but they don't make you sick. No, they don't. So. so <laughs> I think actually to illustrate this uh, species uh, transmission uh, issue, uh, we can talk about uh, the bovine spongiform encephalopathy or mad cow disease. Mm -hmm. um, what's the disease in humans called? Is that what it's called? Jakob Kreutzfeldt. It's, it's no. variant Jakob Kreutzfeldt, yeah. Okay. So actually the, Kuru, the, Kuru the origin of like BSE, that, the origin of BSE in, in the UK traces to... Uh, the farmers, um, or actually the industry, changing the way they rendered um, sheep uh, remains mm -hmm. as part of the food for cattle. Okay? Right. So right. cattle feed contains sheep remains that are actually left over from another process that I think, what, made tallow or something like that? I'm not quite <laughs> sure what it was. But they changed the process from the traditional method, which had the effect of destroying the prions, to ones that was not as effective in uh, destroying the prions. And so the sheep prion got into the cattle. Okay, right. So there's right. a cross-species right. transmission that's relevant. And then the yes. question becomes, holy cow. No, 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 not holy cow. Um, <laughs> that is uh, a holy cow. That is a holy cow. <laughs> people eat beef. Could this be transmitted to people? Right. If, uh, uh, and I think the conclusion has been that, yes, it, it did is. at did. a very low level. But yeah, interestingly, right. interestingly, there's never been a documented case that I know of, of the sheep prion being transmitted to humans. Right? That's right. So the infection of humans went through another species, yes. right? That's correct. Um, so, yeah. And this species adaptation is really weird, too, because what you're talking about is a prion from one species causing misfolding of the prion in another species so that that misfolding is then propagated. And right. there are species barriers. Not every prion will induce that misfolding in another uh, right. animal and or another species, and part of that is because of genetic differences. Okay, they they can't do it, but there seems to be some sort of weird. Maybe it has to do with intermediate states of conformational changes that you can't jump from A to C. You got to go from A to B to C or something like that because sheep don't infect humans, but sheep can infect cows, can infect humans. Okay, right. So this is complicated, very, uh, and and 
uh, and interesting and relevant. So in mice, which have been used as a model, um, for example, I think if you put hamster prions into mice, the mice don't get disease. And these are done by intracerebral inoculation. Vincent, your camera stopped. It did? Yep. Well, it doesn't matter it's because... It's frozen, yeah. That's okay. That's happened before. Sorry. So you um, put hamster prions into mice, the mice don't get sick. But now if you make the mouse transgenic for the hamster prion gene ah. and now inject hamster prions into mice, now they get sick. So the idea is that in many cases, the protein has to match, but it, as Rich said, it doesn't always have to. You can have, and that's, so apparently cow prions can infect humans. We so don't I, don't, I don't get why this is so surprising. I mean, it's like saying PVR for mice. If you put polio into mice and they use the, it doesn't use the mouse PVR version. No, it's you not surprising. To, it's just, it's to just the way it is. Human, you have to put the human PVR gene into mice yeah. to get the mice to work. No, it's it's so, just the observation. That's all. You're right. It it it's may not the same be surprising, observation. but it's uh, but in this case, and by the way, Rich, the the way Prusiner, who got a Nobel Prize for this years yes, ago, the way he used to assay the 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 uh, non pathogenic version of the protein can be completely digested with proteinase K. Okay. Whereas yes, the right. misfolded version, the the right. pathogenic, is very resistant. It's cut into 27 KD fragments right. and you can run those on a gel and see them. So for some reason it, and, and in fact, now we understand that the, the cellular protein is mostly alpha helical and the pathogenic protein has a lot of beta sheets, which probably makes it more resistant to, to proteases. But. And I don't know if we specifically said this, but these are, we've implied it. These are neurodegenerative diseases that are right. uh, uniformly fatal. So the right. other thing that's important to this discussion is that you don't have to be infected. So you can eat uh, contaminated material. You can get transplants of contaminated material. There have been like in the old days when we used to transplant hormones from one person to another, you could transfer it that way. Corneal transplants can do it. But you can also spontaneously develop a prion disease because you have a certain uh, sequence of the prion protein that's apparently predisposed to misfolding. And it could be that the deer suddenly began to misfold years ago and develop this disease, or maybe they got it from some other species that we don't know about, but uh, can happen both ways, right? So that that's the concern here is deer, right? There are a lot of deer. Can they infect other animals? So this is a paper in uh, Emerging Infectious Diseases, Increased Attack Rates and decreased incubation periods of chronic wasting disease in raccoons after passage through meadow voles. So chronic wasting comes from deer, and it's as you'll see, it was passed in meadow voles, and then they infect raccoons with it. This comes from Department of Agriculture and the uh, U.S. Geological Survey uh, in uh, Iowa and uh, Wisconsin. And those are the people who are interested in this, right? Uh, wildlife and use de Department of Agriculture. and. Previously, it's been shown that deer shed these prions. It's in their urine, it's on their fur, it's in their feces, saliva. So you can find them in soil, you can find them in plants, you can find them at mineral licks that people put out and the deer go and lick it, right? The, the prions are there. So um, that, that could be a potential source of infectious material for other wildlife. So... That's part of the or, question here. Or they, or they also mention here gut piles. Are gut piles <laughs> what I think they are? Piles <laughs> of guts. I have never heard that before, but I assume, <laughs> yeah. And an animal dies, and I don't know. Maybe it's when hunters gut out the animal. And Amy, what's a gut pile? Do you know? That's exactly Definitely, what it is. Yeah, but generally, you're as a hunt uh, as a hunter, you're not allowed to do that. Oh, you don't leave your guts behind? You, yeah. No, you have you to have, have the deer weighed at a weighing station. I was going to say, you controlled. have to put the, yeah, you have to take the whole animal out. That's right. You have to put it on a scale. They tell you if it fits the thing. And then you have to take it home, strapped to the roof of your car. But they, and clean, then it. You they can, clean it at the station. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they, have a they lot. don't. I mean, most people take advantage of that. Yeah, I don't know. When I was a kid, there were always deer hanging from... Oh yeah, the, trophies from 
No, he no, he didn't. He didn't. He went by himself. There were always deer hanging from the um, garage door thingy, the tracks for the garage door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. But, I, mean, uh, I assume a gut pile is a pile of guts in the forest. Right? Yeah, but it's <laughs> it's very or, unusual. Yeah, it's unless the animal has died naturally. Because uh, here, there's there's, a, there's actually a movie called Gut Pile. Really? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! So here they say that. Maybe Ian should have used it yesterday for his talk. <laughs> yes, that was funny. There's a paper, apparently, where they said, in Wisconsin, gut raccoons are present at deer carcasses and gut piles. And and they say raccoons are mesopredators and scavengers. And I, I didn't hear that word before, Dixon. You know what a mesopredator is? Uh, well, um, a sometime predator. It's... Yeah, it'll take advantage of garbage. I mean, if, if if they live peridomestically, then they don't hunt. They depend on your generosity. If they live in the semi-wild uh, locations like rivers and streams that are peridomestic, they will hunt for crayfish and things of this sort in the rivers, but they'll also raid your garbage. Okay, so, so, so the raccoons could eat. They could also eat rodents, they say, and rodents, including voles, are known to be infectable with deer prions right? right and voles themselves are scavengers they say and maybe raccoons eat voles who knows so i don't think uh, so you don't think so uh it says there is potential for secondary exposure of raccoons through consumption of contaminated rodents i certainly don't know i'd have to take anyone's word for it because i don't know any of this but they said previously it's been shown that you can take prions from deer and infect Rodents and the vole, the meadow voles are the most susceptible species. And they say these, in fact, are also cannibalistic. You know, the vole could be eaten by another predator and spread it and so forth. So that's, a, that's the, um, that's what the they're premise. looking at here is. Uh, they're looking for networks of transmission. Networks of transmission. And I thought this would just be a, a good way for us to revisit uh, prion diseases and TSEs and what was the story with chronic wasting disease, but it's spreading and it's um, the, the more we look, the more we find it in, in deer. And there, there is actually a website. What is it called? I think it's cwd.org. If you search chronic wasting disease, you'll find it. And they give advice to hunters about what to do and what not to do with your deer when you kill them, you know, stay away from the brain and spinal cord and the eyes and the lymph nodes and uh, so forth. So and that, they say, don't, they should, don't shoot a deer if it's behaving uh, oddly. They should probably um, advise the taxidermist more on that level than they should the hunters. <laughs> yes, that's true. That's true. So anyway, they, what they do here is to take uh, raccoons and they have 17 raccoons and who, who uh, they intracranially inoculate with a brain homogenate of various sources. Um, they have one from deer uh, and then they have one from voles, and then they have another one that's been passaged multiple times uh, in voles. And these are all intracerebral passages, which, of course, is not the way the prions are passed normally. And they do say that uh, in the in the uh, discussion, but it's just a way of knowing whether if you put the prion right in the brain without any feeding or anything, could it cause any disease? Because as I said, certain prions in mice don't, when you do that, they don't cause disease. So there's apparently a species barrier. Um, so they, and they, they look at the raccoons for disease, right? Inability to walk or climb, uh, you know, if they, they appear lazy and so forth, ataxia. Uh, and um, they can show that you can, you can transfer, th these raccoons will get disease using deer, prions using vol prions and if you passage the prion in voles you get a slightly different disease which as rich was saying passage in a different species can sometimes affect uh, the outcome of the disease um, and they they show pathologic changes in the brain which are consistent spongiform change for example and it differs according to the prion from passage in passage in voles or not um, they also find in one one raccoon uh, prions in the enteric nervous system of the stomach, jejunum, ileum, and colon. It's interesting. Wow. So you put it in the brain, and apparently, I don't know, maybe it can get out and go elsewhere. It's no, it just goes down. 
It goes down the nerves and out into the tissues, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sort of a reverse um, rabies. <laughs> well, it's just... Uh, what, so it's retro, it's retro integrated because right? it's out, yeah. it's going out, it's going away from the nucleus or away from the central nervous system. So do yeah. they get gut um, symptoms and signs like you would say with Chagas disease, which also infects the myenteric plexus of the small intestine? I don't think they do. I'm not, I haven't <clears throat> seen that. Yeah. I'm sure that they get diarrhea. Yeah, I think. I'm sure wasting must disease usually you, wasting the disease serotonergic usually serotonergic nervous system. That's, yeah. that's Could be. wasting Could disease be. usually refers to a diarrhea form. Usually refers to having a diarrhea component. So what what I found interesting here. So first of all, the vol passage uh, prions you get a, a shorter incubation period, different neuropathology, etc. That's interesting. But uh, they already know that the there are polymorphisms of the prion protein gene in deer that can affect um, the um, transmission or the, the ability to give to cause disease in another species. So, yeah, I don't think we should use the word transmission. Yeah, trans I agree. We won't use transmission. But the ability of the prion to cause disease, uh, for example, uh, codon 96 of the prion gene, uh, a serine is associated with reduced prevalence in deer. That's interesting. So if the deer have a certain codon, you get less CWD. So that, that brings up the possibility that maybe you uh, find a, a prion sequence that is resistant and then you just breed deer with that. <laughs> Assuming you could make transgenic deer. Maybe you just knock it out in deer, right? And just <laughs> release transgenic deer that don't have uh, the PRNP gene. Anyway, raccoons also have... Uh, um, they say the raccoons are homozygous for glycine at 96, which is the one that gives you more penetrance of the disease. So I think that's all uh, quite interesting. Um, but they do say because intracranial inoculation is not a natural route, oral transmission studies are underway uh, to characterize the behavior of these deer prions and vole passaged prions using a more natural route uh, of exposure. This, you know, this kind of reminds me of uh, some of the studies that have been done with SARS-CoV-2, where, you know, one of the things you want to know is uh, how many different species can it infect. And so you right. uh, do laboratory infections that, yeah. Are, uh, yeah. that are, on, you know, not natural conditions, but laboratory infections of as many different animals as you can. And you get a sense, at least, for whether they're susceptible or resistant. It's not the definitive answer. Uh, but you get you get a, a a sense of susceptibility, and then you, and and then you move on. You know, if these guys had found that if you inject a pile of uh, deer prion directly into the brains of uh, of voles and raccoons, nothing happens. Uh, that would uh, that would give a different perspective than this does. This says yeah. okay, yeah. so let's try and feed it and see what happens. Yeah. I don't so know. That, I mean, I I don't know that I agree with that. I don't know that this says that let's try and feed it. I think that this gives actual credence to people who who have said to us, well, you just inject anything into the brain and you get paralysis. I'm not sure that this is a rigorous scientific study that supports any conclusion. Well, the, the thing is that the whole field uses intracranial inoculation for prions for every species that they study that nobody feeds. I don't know why. It may be that it's highly inefficient, right? Probably. To feed Could animals. Be. But this is what they do. And or it has, maybe it's like there's a, like you can't feed polio to mice because there's an intestinal exactly, block. Exactly right. So yes. I don't know that you would ever conclude anything about transmissibility or anything outside of maybe generously characterizing the pathology. Well, the wildlife side of things, when they go out and make their collections in the wild and they do trappings and then they do surveys this way, would at least uh, bridge the gap between the laboratory uh, results that you're talking about now and whether or not it's actually happening in nature. And I think that's where wildlife biology comes in. I think that, so the, obviously the concern here is whether the, the prions from deer are going to make their way into people. Right? Yeah, that's the big worry. That is the and big worry. I don't know how you do that, right? Um, I'm not sure that that has hasn't happened yet. 
Yeah, but I'm not sure you can use any knowledge from this study to address that question. No, I think that question is as unanswered at the yeah, be- as it is at the beginning of this study as it is at the That's end of true. this discussion. Totally what agree. would you say, Amy, is the best way to ask if the, the prion disease in deer is a threat to humans? How would we right. do that? Right. So what did they do for for showing that it was a threat to so what did they do to show mad cow was a threat uh, to humans? That's, that's epidemiology. <laughs> yeah, right? a human okay. outbreak, right? That was, okay. so you had an outbreak in cows, and then a few years later, you suddenly had an outbreak in so, people. They all had epidemiologic connections. That's to how consuming. we do things. That's how yep. we usually do no, things. No, that's, that's same the world of wildlife. They, they do the same with wildlife. Yeah. So basically, if we do not see um, an increase in human TSC, with epidemiologic connections to consumption of deer, then we shouldn't worry about it, right? Yeah, yeah, not. So. We should worry about it, but there's nothing you can do anyway. <laughs> yeah. what, if it, what if it did do it? Then what would you do? I mean, That's the biggest question. Right, but pretty much that's how we identify everything that is a concern to humans, is that there's an epidemiological observation of a change. Right. And then we go and investigate. It was so you, there's an epidemiological change in the pneumonia that people are coming to the hospital in Wuhan and with. We've never seen this before. What is causing it? Right. That's how you identified SARS CoV two. So <clears throat> we know that there are so many deer now in at least in this country, uh, that if you go to the point where America was first being colonized, the it's about uh, one in a hundred thousand fold more deer now than there were then. And that was an undisturbed environment. So we have caused this, uh, I wouldn't call it a pandemic of, of, of deer, but Vincent, you've got a deer problem in your backyard. And, uh, you know, you live in a fairly domesticated uh, area of the world. And people out on Long Island have got tons of it. And we've got other diseases that deer can transmit to people that we're still worried about, like Lyme disease and that sort of thing. So, um, and obviously they get SARS-CoV-2 from humans, right? And they do. That's exactly right. So, so there's, they're close and maybe they could give it back to people. So there's a clearly some contact between human and deer. Right? That's deer, right. Yeah. So why don't we have programs now to call deer to the levels that they should be existing at rather than what they are at? Because people feed them out of their backyard. And, and people that don't like the deer, they're hiring bow hunters hmm. to come at night. Because it doesn't make any noise, <laughs> and they're shooting deer at night using you have lights deer in Texas, to attract. Rich? Oh God, yes! Oh, yeah. oh my God, yes! You have, you have a lot of deer, yeah. Oh yeah, you but not where you, you not where you live, right? Oh yeah, really? Uh, because, well, no, because we're we're pretty uh, we're uh, we're on the edge of urban Austin. Okay, we're and okay. And we're even on the edge of suburban Austin. Okay, you take you go not far from our house, and you're matter of fact, you know the the. Uh, areas where uh, my wife and I walk regularly uh, are, uh, they're uh, residential, but they're, you know, lots that are like acre lots and that kind of stuff. And it's crawling with deer. There's, we see, we see, you know, groups of up to a dozen. uh, You've got got mule deer mostly, don't you? Yeah. Well, uh, I don't know, Dixon, because I'm not a you know, deer, uh, <laughs> no, just look I, at their ears. Different. The mule deer have gigantic ears. You can tell them apart. How about their easy. tails? What's a white-tailed deer look like? Yeah, it's got white a tail. big white tail. White tail when <laughs> no, these have big white tails. <laughs> so I'm thinking, so in my, the deer all over my grass, they poop on it. They must pee. They must lick Everything. the grass. So in the summer, I cut the grass and I aerosolize all that stuff. Right. Who knows, right? Maybe that's who knows. Is maybe right. I could inhale something in a, a prion maybe. or a or a virus. Who knows, right? So it's we easy. We don't wish that on you. That's for sure. Even though I don't. No, the point is that I don't go up to deer and try and have contact with them, but I can have indirect contact from the environment. There's tons of deer poop on my grass, right? Oh, all sure. those little pellets all over the place. And that's right. if I'm walking my dogs, they want to eat it. I try, I prevent them, but they would That's like right. to eat the door, the dog poop. So That's there's another. Anyway. That's what voles do. Voles do that. Voles eat poop? Yeah. They're coprophagous. Dogs are coprophagous, right? They are. A lot anyway, of so this are. is a complicated issue, but I think you're right, Amy. You, you know, we see this epidemiological 
change. And then, but in the case of prions, you know, we saw Kuru and and humans developing Kreutzfeld Jakob. And Stanley Prusner said, What's causing this? Right? He was a neurologist. And he eventually found this mechanism, which I that's what we want to do in the end. We want to figure out the mechanism, right? And even right. though he used an abnormal way of inoculating, he could get yeah, yeah, to the yeah. point where they showed this protein is is responsible for this. And I think that's fascinating. Well, nobody is arguing that it's not fascinating. It's just I agree. it's just at the end of the day, we wait for we are not a proactive <laughs> society. <true>. No, <laughs> we are right. a retroactive. Have a couple of people die. Have a couple of people die in an area, and then we do, and then we investigate. We throw up our hands and say, "Now what?" Uh, speaking of which, it's, it's probably it's probably relevant that I know of no reports of any human cases that are suspicious of transmission of CWD to humans. That's right? correct. And there's, and there's certainly plenty in deer and plenty of human deer interaction. And not, it's not the same moves. as, the, and that having been said, you know, it's not like uh, we consume uh, deer meat at the same sort of rate as we uh, consume beef. Mm-hmm. And the signal above background for BSE, I believe, was, uh, I, I recall debating about it for a long period of time, whether this was really a signal above background. So, I have an anecdotal story that will amuse all of you, and that is that I was in England uh, during one of the outbreaks of uh, BSE, and uh, the meat just stayed on the shelves of the grocery stores. Sure, sure. And they couldn't do anything about it except – they lowered the price of the meat about five days later, and they sold out. <laughs> Do you know, Dixon, if you lived in the UK during that period, you cannot donate blood? Right. Because uh, yeah. because the I was potential so is that the prions that are still in the, you. The price of meat uh, was the... Um, was the determiner of whether people actually yeah. ate the meat or yeah. didn't. And they sold it to them, too. I mean, they wouldn't take it off the shelves. They didn't uh, reclaim it. Yeah, but I also think that we underestimate how much venison people eat outside of metropolitan cities. You're right. Cities. There's a lot of people live I think, on that. I think a lot of people <laughs> eat a lot of venison outside of metropolitan they cities. Well, they don't true. necessarily eat uh, it pure. Sometimes they mix half and half. Like you're supposed to make an Italian meatball with like a third pork, a third veal, a third beef. <laughs> Sometimes people that's they yeah they make like a meatball half beef half half venison. That's true. Oh. Wow. Yeah, half what beef, half they, lamb, half they, half. The, the, the hunting so. season is very limited in ma- most areas, but the carcass of the deer when they have it butchered could last an entire year. So you yeah. could be eating that all year long. Yeah, but and and what they do is a lot of. They go to the freezer and then they like mix it half and half. It's true. So I don't mm. I don't know that we actually have any idea uh, in reality. And you don't always, yeah. I don't think we know exactly how much people how much people eat outside of, you know, our traditional way of thinking of going to the grocery store and and purchasing, you know, the ground it's, beef to make the hamburger. Sure. So here's another way of getting it, and that. In the old days, believe it or not, I was a member of the NRA as a teenager, and I shot Match 22 rifle, and uh, they would have targets, and you'd advance through the stages. Every year, to the awards ceremony, they had a dinner, and it was a uh, all venison dinner. Yeah, Start to finish, they had uh, hunter soup, the chopper, a roast. They had uh, they didn't have any sausage because they didn't get that fancy, but every year. Uh, for about maybe six years, I was <laughs> dining with the rest of the kids, having and guess where the deer came from? They were all roadkill. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I remember like we would go visit my aunt. No, we would go visit my aunt who had a second house in New Lebanon, New York. So you went up the Taconic, sure. yeah. and in the winter, people would hit deer that were crossing the street. And they would just drive off. But my Correct. family would, if they saw that, my father would pull over and he'd find the deer and then he'd, he'd finish the job. Hmm. And lo and behold, we, in, in 
Next thing you knew, you had a deer. Right. The thing is, though, when you hit a deer, there's a price to pay for that, and that is the repair on your car if it doesn't kill you by going through your windshield. So every time you hit a deer, in New York State at least, you're obliged to call the police. Hmm. I've only done that once in my life. Oh, I, don't know. Do? I, don't know. I don't remember that. I don't remember and, uh, whether yeah, or not. Well, you're, I think the law was instituted a lot later on than the stories that you were telling. But uh, I remember the deer that I killed trying to avoid the deer. It was backing off the road with the headlights of the car coming in the opposite direction in the deer's head. All right. So the deer didn't even see me. And uh, I hit the deer along the side of the car that the passenger was sitting on. And it did about three flips and it landed in a, a neighbor's front yard. And right. I stopped. Of course, I was stunned. And I knocked on the door and they said, we don't want to get involved in this. This happens too often here. So they yeah. said, we'll call the police for you. But that's all. And so the police came and we had to fill out a damage report because that is an insurance a problem and you should see the insurance rates of new jersey are incredible and a lot of that is due to the um, accidental killing of deer by the cars a lot of damage fifteen hundred dollars to the car that i was driving that's just yeah, a side uh, step, but, you know the other but, day when i was waiting for the train the first time i saw a pack of deer crossing the tracks really oh my I god i have never seen that before <laughs> you know I'm about sorry. a dozen and this is, you know, uh, yeah, fairly, yeah, you know. I just wondered if the trains ever hit deer, right? For sure. Oh, they must. They must. You for think? sure they do. They for must. Sure. Now, for a train, that's not a big deal, but no. for a car, I'm sure. And remember in the old days, there's, uh, the the locomotives had these big... Yeah, the stick. Uh, this, uh, do you know what they called them? Cow, cow catchers. catchers. Yeah. Exactly. Cow catchers. Because they catch cows, right? Well, they could force them off the railroad tracks when they were going across <laughs> if they went slow enough. Uh, well, one last story here is that, um, by the <laughs> way, Amy, yesterday when I was with Ian, he was telling me all kinds of stories about wildlife consumption. <laughs> <laughs> Not surprising. But uh, when I was a kid, my parents took me for some to some Italian festival at a big hall, you know, with some holiday and all kinds of food. And then at one point, they brought out a huge tray of uh, goat skulls. Really? Goat or sheep. I don't know what it was. With the brain cooked inside it. It was a oh, big snack. Goodness. And they put it on the table. And in ten, five minutes, they were gone. People just ran up and took them. Wow. I'm like, oh, my gosh. And then you open them up and you take the brain out. But, yeah, people eat all kinds of things. and um, They eat everything. Pretty much everything. Everything. Yeah. everything. <laughs> but, but with respect to deer causing... TSEs and people, you know, Christfield Jakob, the rate is about one per million people per year. That's right. Um, which is not zero, right? So a few hundred cases per year in the U.S. I don't know why you wouldn't say that some might be co unless caused by deer prions, unless the, you expect the disease to be very different or maybe you could get, I, I don't know how you would tell, right? Because the deer prion would be making your prion Misfold, so it's right. actually your prion that's causing the disease, not the deer prion, right? That's right, that's right. In the case of the mad cow disease in people, it was a distinct incubation period, a distinct pathology, which when you pass prions in a different species, it often happens, as we've said multiple times here, and they could tell by that that it was different, plus the epidemiological connection to, but that's an outbreak. And so with an endemic pattern, I think it would be really hard to know uh, if it were deer, unless you saw an outbreak, right? So that's probably what we're going to have to wait for. If it ever happens. Ho hopefully forever, yeah. Yeah, it might not happen. It might not happen. But but one last question, Dixon. So sure. there are a lot of deer in the U.S., but there are also a lot of rodents, right? Lots of rodents. But we probably wouldn't notice if they developed a TSE, right? Because they're little and they just they hit don't most of the time. They, they don't, don't live long. long. Maybe they don't live long enough for a TSE, yeah. I mean, I think a, an injured vole would be instant food for a bunch of predator species like coyotes and wolves and yeah. wild yeah. dogs, et cetera. So those, those would not be uh, trappable even. Okay. Chronic wasting disease prions. Uh, we have a paper which is published in Cell... Low fidelity assembly of influenza A virus promotes escape from host cells by Vahi and Fletcher uh, at um, 
Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley, and Washington University. And this actually continues a, a, a topic we talked about before, that influenza virus, you know, makes different kinds of particles, round particles and long particles. And uh, the outcome of our last discussion with that was that this is random. Even though some genes can influence it, it seems to be a, a random, at least part of the process is random and non-genetic. So uh, they come back here and they ask, could this particle variation have any contribution to uh, influenza virus biology? So, and I, the thing that I liked about this was the method they used to study it, right? I think so it's the, a stretch to say about pathology that it's it has any that it has an influence on pathology or whatever you just uh, said. You said biology. biology. Biology, yeah, biology. I think it's a stretch. Well, I think it's an important question to know whether if a filamentous, because the observation is when you um, uh, human isolates of influenza virus, when you get a nose swab and you put it in culture, you get a lot of filamentous forms. But then as you grow them in culture, they become spherical, right? So, you know what? I remember this discussion from that episode that we had. And it's curious as to why this is the topic for a modern version of the same question. Actually, Didn't this paper precedes for that. This paper oh. was published before the other one we discussed. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm we sorry. Discussed. Okay. okay. And, I missed the date. I'm sorry. You know, I get uh, one of my impressions of this paper is that uh, it's kind of uh, technique driven. Yes. Uh, I would even I would even go so far as to say, and it, not disparaging it, but that it's in a way a technical fishing expedition. I can imagine a conversation <laughs> of, you know, with the techniques that are coming out now, we can probably uh, label specific proteins in yeah, flu sure. influenza virions without compromising their infectivity. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's try it and see what we see. And <laughs> this is what they saw. Yes, but that, yeah. that doesn't impact the biology. There's no extrapolate. There's no way to extrapolate the bio that this has any impact in actual virus biology, and studying something that's random also is not really telling you anything about the impact of biology. By biology, you mean transmission, or any aspect of or biology. Any aspect, any aspect of, the aspect the of the virus. I don't think it tells you anything about how the virus replicates. I don't think it tells you anything really about how the virus attaches to the cell. It doesn't tell you how it causes uh, any how it rep how it reproduces its genome or packages itself to bud off. It doesn't tell you anything about budding. It doesn't tell you anything about how it cause what what it does in order to cause some kind of disease or some immune response to you. It's I was I have this technique and I I want I want to show that this technique works. Yeah, I, but isn't it an interesting question? What's the function of this uh, morphological variability? Or do you no. think it's not of interest at all? It's it's an artifact because. Okay. You get it. You just finished telling me when you take a nasal swab, it's all filamentous. Right. Then it becomes. Then you grow it up in eggs or MDCK cells, which are not. Well, I don't know what you're. What, they're like HeLa cells for flu. Yeah. So if you're going to yeah. argue that HeLa cells are not relevant to polio virus in fact uh, biology and stuff, then th then those cells being the HeLa cells for flu are not relevant. It's not done in an like an airway liquid epithelial culture or anything. So so that would be interesting if you did an airway interface culture and showed they maintain the filamentous form, then you could say, ah, this is an artifact of growth in laboratory cell lines, right? Hasn't yeah. that been done? It must be. I just, I'm not aware of it. They didn't talk about it here at all, actually. So just for the uninformed, how many other viruses have this as part of their... Uh, so, morphological development, let's say. Pleomorphism. Yeah. Polymorphism seems to correlate with all viruses that don't have a protein structural component. Like they don't right. have a nucleocapsid, they don't have an icosahedral capsid. So a lot of viruses then. Yes. So they say... Not uncommon. Flate. So 
It's common. This pleomorphism is common, as Amy said, among envelope viruses, filoviruses, pneumoviruses, Philo, of course, of course. paramyxoviruses, influenza viruses. And they say even within families where particle uh, morphology is comparatively uniform, and they use the flavies, which, as Amy said, they have a shell, a protein nucleocapsid, which kind sure. of constraints. And of course, polio and icosahedral particles don't show any polymorphism as far as we can see, right. although Amy, there's probably slight breathing and stuff, right? Yeah. But you can't see breathing. it. Well, I mean, you'd have to, right. But like coronas have a pleomorphic tropism because it's enveloped and, and stuff. So just they looking think, at the shapes of things yeah. and the, the morphology of viruses in general, if you spread them all out, they've got huge variation, Right. I mean, they, they cover the gambit of geometry. You mean basically. different viruses? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I've got one of your pictures sitting in my office right now. The, the painter yeah. uh, painted a whole bunch of shapes and <laughs> sizes of viruses. And yeah. so it's, it doesn't matter what shape or size you are, you can find a way to reproduce. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I Nothing think that's stops correct. them from doing that. I mean, that's that's they, quite amazing, actually. I think, I think to a certain extent, the authors are driven by tech, as is mentioned, but I also think. People want to know what is the function of this? Is is it really nothing, or is there something there? And so we may not have an answer after this, but <laughs> you know, people are curious about it and they want to figure out ways to address it. So, so, um, uh, so I think it's interesting that uh, you know you get. Is it true that you get predominantly filamentous forms out of um, nasal physiological swans. samples? Predominantly, yes. Okay. I think it's interesting that uh, that's the case as opposed to culture. I mean, you could say that the uh, culture forms, the more spherical forms, are an artifact. But nevertheless, there's, it's interesting that there's a difference. Yeah. It would, I think it's an interesting question whether that has any effect on, even if it's not biology in the larger sense, uh, the activity, call it, of those uh, virions in culture. You wonder why... Is 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 there any uh, purpose uh, or advantage of making filamentous forms uh, in a, a natural infection? And mm-hmm. what controls it? Okay, is this just a random thing? Okay, I think those are all legitimate questions. They I are. mean, if you could take a filovirus and somehow make a change in the genome, which may, gave you spherical particles. Then you could right. ask, what's the difference? Does it grow differently in cells? Does it cause different disease in animals? Is it more resistant to antibodies or less resistant? Whatever. But you could also argue that the change has screwed up something else too. So it's it's a hard right. one. So, but so how does it look? How does this virus grow in uh, organoids from the right tissue of humans? Uh, it's not known. It's uh, or, organoids no? have not really been exploited for this virus. Wow. Wow. However, Dixon, I was just thinking the other paper that we did previously actually used um, physical methods to Mm -hmm. uh, sort these uh, filamentous forms from the smaller forms and studied them in as different pools to see if they had different properties. Uh, None of this, uh, I don't know if it would be possible uh, or how easy it would be to do. So I recall none of these involve animal studies. Okay, it's all right. tissue culture. Okay, right. So, right. and and it would have been interesting, and you wouldn't have ruled it out automatically as an artifact if it if every time you grew it in this in that same cell, you had the same proportion right. of right. filamentous right. to round, but you don't. So, so it's, a it's whimsical, just in growing a stock. So you can grow a stock in your MDK cells on Tuesday and get X percent and X and Y percent. And then you can do it again on Friday and you'll get completely different numbers. Anyway, the way they addressed this was they said, can we label fluorescently label multiple proteins in the virus particle and then get a handle? Because, you know, a bigger, a long particle should have more Proteins, maybe a different ratio. What is it? Nobody's really looked at that. So they develop a way to to do this. And the problem is you can't stick big fluorescent. You can't put green fluorescent protein. It's too big. It's going to mess up the virus. 
but they have a way to put small short amino acid sequences. And this is what I think is neat. 10, 10 ish amino acids, which have come from different uh, laboratories and which can be specifically labeled with a fluorescent chemical or a fluorescent compound, right? And so one example, which I pulled up, there's a tag called YBBR, right? Which came from Bacillus subtilis, a short 11 amino acid peptide from a library of Bacillus subtilis. Turns out to be a substrate for an enzyme that you can use to attach a fluorescent molecule to this 10 amino, 11 amino acid substance. It's called YBBR because it's from the, the YBBR ORF in the subtilis genome. So they have four, three or four different ways using different enzymes and different amino acid sequences of putting fluorophores onto these viral proteins. And I thought that was pretty neat. Um, and you can do this, um, you know, as the virus is growing in cells, you can, you can label it in the cells by adding the enzyme and, and the fluorophore and so forth. And, you know, they, they go through the, the, I think they have viruses, they use one virus. So that's another problem. They don't use multiple influenza virus, but they use one virus for this study. Um, and they say they're able to label three or four proteins uh, in these viruses. They can uh, label the hemagglutinin, uh, the neuraminidase, uh, the uh, M1 protein, uh, and the nuclear protein. I want to, uh, 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 I'm blanking here for a minute. First of all, I'd like to, so that people can uh, halfway visualize this, go over the structure a little bit, okay? So you have an, uh, an eight-component RNA genome. Right. Uh, and that is uh, coated with, uh, it, uh, I, what's the difference between N and NP? Uh, N and NP are the same thing. Uh, I, oh, I see what they have in the genes here, N and NP. What is that? N. Because NP is the nuclear protein, right? Right. What the hell is N? Envelope. No. <laughs> no it, we have the HANA, the nuclear protein, the M, and then the components of the polymerase, PA and PB1 and 2. What is N? Neuraminidase. I mean, it's no, NA is, is, is NA. What is N? That's a good question. <laughs> Don't they say what it is? <laughs> well, they, they must, but... Let me see here. I'm going to search because I this figure where they're using eight plasmids basically to uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yes. Uh, PA, PB1, PB2, M. Now this is this is no good. I have to go look at my flu lecture now. We're going to have to wait a minute to Open sort this book. out because um, uh, where would that be now? Which lecture would I have influenza virus structure? Let's let's look at uh, uh, entry. That would be lecture five. Uh, actually, N is that the same as NS one? Oh, NS one. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. So yes. we got uh, the NS, polymerase is PA, PB one, PB two. Okay, so those are components of the polymerase. Very few molecules yeah, yeah, yeah. per virion. Non uh, we protein, have yeah. um, NP, which is the protein uh, that coats the RNA inside right. the particle. Okay, so that's going to be fair, fairly high dense density and internal. Then we have M, the matrix protein, and that forms a, basically a shell around the nucleocapsid and underlies the membrane or serves as, in a way, a scaffold for the membrane. you got a membrane, and then embedded in the membrane are these two proteins, HA, hemagglutinin, and uh, uh, NA, neuraminidase. Hemagglutinin is the virus attachment protein. Neuraminidase, has, uh, as we, will, we may discuss, uh, actually is a receptor-destroying enzyme that helps mm -hmm. the virus uh, spread. So the ones they tag, then, are HA, the hemagglutinin mm -hmm. on the membrane, and NA, the neuraminidase, also embedded in the membrane. The uh, uh, M protein, the matrix protein that surrounds uh, the particle, and um, the nuclear protein, NP. Mm -hmm. They have capability of tagging all four of those. That's right. So what you do is you put these amino acid sequences in the virus. They show you it doesn't impair 
reproduction. You then can collect the virus after it comes out of cells, and you can use these enzymes to label each of these individual uh, pro viral proteins with a fluorophore, and then you can you can say measure the size of the particles. You can do flow cytometry. You can do uh, um, quantification uh, and so forth. So it gives you a way of marking both surface proteins and internal proteins and saying how do these differ in different size particles and so forth. That's that's the that's the um, the mechanism uh, the the methodology. Um, so, for example, you can say, what is the range of size that we see here? And they do a length versus frequency, which they can do now because now they can see the particles easily by the fluorescence and measure them. And it's, you know, when you grow them in these cells in culture, most 90% of the virus particles are pretty small. They're less than 1,000 nanometers. Only 10% are longer. So it's a very small fraction of um, the uh, the total population that are actually elongated under these conditions. But some of those are huge. Some of them are 8,000 nanometers in length, very long, yes. <laughs> That's very big, but it's a very small pr fraction. One of the things they do is say, how many HA and NA are on the virus, the average they get? Uh, so for uh, spherical particles, they get 1,000 HAs, and 95 neuraminidases, right? Which are comparable to what people have figured out before by mass spec, for example. So 10 to 1, essentially. 10 to 1, yeah. So, and that's about what we think, that there's a lot more hemagglutinin in than uh, neuraminidase, which kind of says that the, the labeling technique is, is accurate to some extent, right? Um, they can look at uh, the abundance of hemagglutinin and neuraminidase compared to the structural proteins. So they say there's this can span a hundred fold range. You can have a hundred fold range in ratio of HA and NA to say the M protein, which is the structural protein under the virus particle. And they say this appears to be affected by morphology because uh, if they use if so, M the M1 gene has been reported to influence whether you get elongated particles or not. And they say if we use the M1 from a strain which you know, can influence the, the particles, um, you get an, a more monodispersed particles and a narrow distribution of HA abundance. So in other words, can, the, yeah. yes, yes. Can any of the uh, segmented genome escape from the host cell without being a complete virus? A good question, because they have, they talk about this assay that's, what did they call it? Semi-infectivity? Yeah, Semi-infectious particles. So they call it, <laughs> semi -infectious there, are a lot of, particles. there are a lot of non-infectious particles made, but they say there's also semi-infectious Which particles. I think, which uh, as I looked at the methods, I found this paper, by the way, difficult to read, um, but I didn't, I could have spent more time on it. At any rate, uh, semi-infectious, I interpreted ultimately as the ability of a particle to deliver transcription units to a cell, but not necessarily right. uh, in a fashion sufficiently complete to make a plaque. That's correct. Okay, That's correct. And, and they talk about it as if some of this may arise from particles that don't have all eight segments. Right. That so wasn't sucrose, absolutely clear, but that's what, and the, as I recall, Vincent, correct me if I'm wrong, this virus is, uh, it's constructed, it's designed, put it that way, uh, with mechanisms in place to try and ensure that every particle has one each of the eight segments. Mm -hmm. I remember. But apparently that's not, that. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't work right all the yeah, time. Yeah, it's not that fully accurate. Yeah, that's okay. fair. Yeah. Uh, in fact, there's. Um, they say that the total the ratio of total particles to fully infectious particles, right? The particle to PFU ratio ranges from ten to a hundred. Wow! Right. So you, many and, and some viruses are worse, right? Than that, some are better, some are worse. And so one they thing, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. It's okay. Well, one thing I liked about this when they were looking at particle to infectivity ratio, and this doesn't solve all of my problems with this, but with this particular concept particle infectivity ratio is that they can take uh, essentially a lysate from cells and uh, label the virus and stick it to a slide 
with a, a uh, by a specific body. interaction with an antibody, okay, mm. and then count the particles, okay, without right. having to otherwise subject them to purification methods that might otherwise damage the particles. Now, that doesn't mean that these procedures they're doing will damage the particles, but I've always had a problem with particle infectivity measurements because usually they involve purifying the particles and you don't know how much damage you're going to do to them in the process. Mm. This is the closest mm. I've seen to a method where you can actually look and with a minimum of manipulation, count the particles. And it's interesting to me that under those circumstances, they still come out with a particle infectivity ratio that's, uh, yeah. 10 to 1, which they say it kind of matches the literature values. Is that correct? Yeah, that's what they say. Yeah. So then they say, what's the source of this morphological variability, right? So <laughs> there are three possibilities. It could be genetic, which probably isn't the case because we've seen from the other paper it's not. Or it could just be <laughs> mistakes that are made because the process isn't perfect, right? So, and they say if it if it's one of these other processes, not genetic, then a virus that infects a single cell uh, shouldn't breed true. It shouldn't give. If you take a long virus and infect a single long virus and infect the cell, it should give rise either to single long viruses if it's genetic or a whole mixture if it's just. Uh, it's random, not a clone. Right? It's not a clone, exactly right. Yeah, the other thing is that, that viruses, as I recall us in the early days of this podcast, all agreed that there, there are varieties of monkey wrenches that are thrown into a normal cellular mechanism. So why should it be perfect? Oh, yeah. There should be a no, lot of right. extra production to oh, yeah. ensure its transmission. And every, so it's, it's a, there's a lot of steps involved, and at each step there's a certain exactly, probability of exactly. failure, too. So, exactly, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. It's not like an automobile assembly line where every step is perfect, right? I would say that I would say I would go so far as to say <laughs> that you know, wait a minute, I have to say I have to stop you here, Rich. He drives a BMW. So, you know, they don't make mistakes at BMW, but they do at other places. <laughs> I know, I know. I was I was, I was thinking as I was reading this that viruses are pretty sloppy. On the other hand, nature's pretty sloppy. Okay. If yes. you consider the yes. uh, sort of the success rate of making a sea turtle. Yeah, so but means, in this whole discussion, yeah. but uh, as you continue to discuss this, you undermine the principle of plaque purification. <laughs> so your idea that if you pick a plaque and you purify that virus, it's a clonal population. And so through that, this entire discussion, you've now told people that that's no longer, well, that's isn't absolutely, really, right? totally true. Because so that there's no point in doing that step whatsoever. No, there because is. But if you, if you purify does, does a plaque, every... then you grow it. You're going to have quasi-species generation already. But you could have a different... If you took a clinical isolate, you have to plaque it because otherwise you may have mixed viruses. You may have different viruses in that same plaque. So I think you still need to do it. Right. That's a different, that's a different question. Yeah. So here, their question is, you're, you're discussing the ability to take one virus and infect a cell and see the same phenotype. It, as far as this morphological right. phenotype. Which yeah. is yeah. basically analogous to saying, I picked a plaque of, polio res of a polio that's resistant to ribavirin. I purified that plaque. I purified that plaque and all of those viruses should now, by your definition, all of those viruses, it's sloppy. So 50% no, maybe. Aren't, some aren't. Right. Exactly. But, but you would have, you would have argued two days ago that if you, if I came to you and I said, I'm looking for a variant that's resistant to X, you would have said to me three rounds of plaque purification. Yeah. I still, I would still say that because well, for, at a genetic level, that is that gives you a pure population as far as you can go. But remember, there's a quasi species at each step, so you're going to have the majority. Well, but but you're not going to lose that original. You're, you're 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 giving with the right hand, and you're taking away with uh, the left okay. hand. Okay, but this is different because it's a morphological it's property that is that is not controlled by the genome, apparently. Right. It, well, that's the point, right? Yes, that's the point. I said they, sloppy. I didn't say how sloppy. 
Yeah, right. it's, it's not infinitely sloppy. I'm confident <laughs> that you can plasturify a, a virus and uh, be uh, reasonably confident that for a period of time, you have a genetically uh, more or less pure clone. So, Rich, another way of doing this study mm. would have been to create uh, sucrose gradients and take the lysates from the plaques that are generated and separate all those particles according to their plant densities and then just taking each of those little fractions and seeing whether or not they're infectious or not. Uh, yeah, that's what the other paper did. The other paper I, did that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so what did they show? I don't they remember. showed that some were and some were, right? <laughs> yeah, they, they, <laughs> showed, sloppy, they showed that, that if you, right, they showed if you had an elongated virus, you were more oh, infectious right. than if you had a circular virus. Okay. Because we okay. had this whole conversation about surface area ratio, yeah. right. that yeah, when you're right. a curved surface, you have less molecules that can bind to the receptor no, you're right. You're right. You're right. than you're when right. you are flat. And that's why when you are flat, you in that paper, you are more resistant to the presence of the monoclonal antibody than if you are in a circle and you are curved. Because if you have 22 molecules that are mediating the attachment, and three, your binding efficiency and affinity is going to be much greater. Yep. So the way they address this issue here is by they infect cells at a low multiplicity, and then when, when viruses exit, the infected cell, they have antibody on the cover slip that traps the virus uh, there. And so they can see what they're immobilized now. The viruses are immobilized. So they can see what's coming oh, out of an individual idea. cell. Yeah, and they say, basically, idea. you have similar distributions coming out as, as, as you see in the other experiments. You, you get everything coming out no matter what you put in. So, again, it's not genetically controlled. It's something beyond that. Uh, which raises the question, why are they predominantly filamentous yeah. in physiological samples, which uh, uh, actually recalls the experiment we were talking uh, about right. earlier, which is do this whole right thing. Type. Well, or do it in a raft culture that uh, is closer to replicating an epithelium. Yeah, exactly. Well, exactly. There's also the fact that the lungs if you're replicating in the lower track is in a negative pressure zone and various yeah. other things. Could be right? all different, kinds of different factors, sugar yeah. Yeah. Right. So you have different, you have different tensions on the cell. So yep. you might not be budding off. I mean, it's what mechanical physiology or whatever right. they're calling it. Something. Well, nowadays. there's another whole um, layer to studying the way cells behave and it's called molecular ecology. And how all those molecules mm. actually fit together. How does that, you know, if you could crawl inside of a cell and watch it work, I think we would be so dumbfounded by the difference with what we know than what actually goes on that uh, we would have to revise virtually every written uh, manuscript about cells, cell physiology and cell biology. So not knowing what goes on in the cell from cell type to cell type and knowing that this is a promiscuous virus because it can reproduce in lots of different cells, those molecular ecologies are different with mm, each of those yeah, cell types. Yeah. And that, that that alone may account for what's going on. Good. But I think, isn't I thought flu was pretty selective about what cells well, it actually infects. How many I mean, different kinds of cells can you infect with flu? That's the good question. Well, right? it is because it's much um, less promiscuous than polio. I mean, polio you well, can almost uh, sure, okay, or West Nile or some other viruses too. But it's not just one cell type. It's very. It's pretty finicky. It's, no, it's, I mean in nature, uh, yes, but in the laboratory, no, no it's can, pretty finicky in the lab. So, how yeah. many cell types in the lab? So MDKCs, A5, which are A549s, uh, bovine and, and kidney, and those MDKs. are lung cells, right? No, A549s are lung are carcin and uh, no carcinoma. I see. So they're lung cells, but they don't they're, do HeLa cells, right? They don't or do men? HeLa's. They don't do RDs. They don't do Vera's. They don't. I don't think that they do H2H7s, BHKs. Yeah. But cells that can reproduce in vitro are different cells than you would get from a normal animal to try to see if it could infect those cells, right? You'd have to admit that. Yeah. 
there's something wrong with those other cells. Well, for sure. That allows them to reproduce. So, for sure, so there's something wrong with all the cells that allow <laughs> us to reproduce the virus. So, Any virus. There, are, there are some cells where certain influenza virus will not reproduce, but if you add a protease to the medium to cleave ah. the hemagglutin in, then it will reproduce. So that's a major you know. determinant sure, sure, uh, sure. of being sure. able to infect is to have the right sure. protease, which is what is present in the respiratory epithelium. Right. It's, and Tempress-2 is one of them, the cell surface protease that also cleaves uh, the spike of SARS-CoV-2. Yeah, but, but Barrick got around that. That Barrick made that same observation yeah, with Ian. Just add trypsin. On, yeah, you just added trypsin. Yeah, and exactly. Ian forgot that he was even on the paper. <laughs> <laughs> Ian was on the paper. Yeah, we talked to Ian about it, like when we were when I was really obsessed with entry, and you know, uh, I forget what. And we had Susan Weiss on it on 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 several discussions also. And then at some point we discussed it with Ian, and he said, "Huh?" And we said, "But you're on the paper." That's, that's, <laughs> he's on too many papers. Robert was, Good ran into that problem too. By the way, we, we won't go there. <laughs> all right, let me let me tell you about one more experiment. Uh, they have they feel that uh, th this morphology may allow uh, the virus to be more resistant to inhibitors, neuraminidase inhibitors. You know, like Tamiflu, right? Which people can take. Um, and so, so they ask the question is. Would a virus of one morphology or the other, and it's they're measuring it by amounts of these surface glycoproteins, right? Because the longer you get, the more of them you're going to have. So that's a nice surrogate for for length. Um, so they treat with um, neuraminidase inhibitors, and what they say is, so they treat infected cells, and as they increase the inhibitor of uh, Tamiflu. Released viruses became increasingly enriched in virus particles with more neuraminidase in them. And there were less of the higher hemagglutinin particles uh, in this preparation. Now, these are the viruses that are released. Remember, neuraminidase inhibitors inhibit release of particles from the cell surface because they're stuck on their receptors. And the, the neuraminidase is what cleaves the receptors so they can move away. And of course, the neuraminidase inhibitors inhibit neuraminidase so they remain on the surface and that's why they help you clinically. Uh, so then they say what remain on the cell surface have higher HA content than NA and they're more filamentous. So there are shifts in the HA-NA ratio. So the viruses that can get off in the presence of the inhibitor have more neuraminidase and the ones that are stuck have less neuraminidase. Okay. And so that, that's their, their, their observation there that um, perhaps longer viruses with more neuraminidase can be more resistant to uh, antivirals, at least at that step, right? They, what they say is low fidelity assembly, which they're saying, they call this a low fidelity process where you can get small particles and long ones. I think that's a human thing. I don't know if it's low fidelity or not. Results in phenotypic heterogeneity that could help uh, subpopulations, in, in this case, uh, with uh, neuraminidase inhibitors. Which suggests that the virus is actually thinking and doing something. No, I think it's a selection issue, right? Because if you make mm, viruses I'm not, of all... I'm not big, clear it's a selection issue. It, or if you just... Because you can't... You, I mean, I'm not clear that... When you assemble, you just don't make as much. The particle is not as big until it buds off. And so since you can't really bud off, you just keep adding. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure it makes much of a difference because in the end, if you to really be resistant to the neuraminidase inhibitors, you need a change in the, in the neuraminidase protein, right? That doesn't let the drug bind or something. So, so. what is that, uh, what is that oseltamivir experiment say about spread if anything uh and uh and size or morphology of the virus so i think it says that the viruses that are released have more neuraminidase right so they're longer so some viruses can be released in the presence of the inhibitor but i don't know clinically what that means right because I'm just trying to, I'm right. just, and I don't have an answer to this. I'm just trying to think whether, um, 
whether actually having a heterogeneous population of sizes, uh, uh, um, if, if different sizes are better at either binding or not binding, that is spreading, okay, then having uh, a variety of different sizes could be yeah. an advantage over being uniform. But I have thought is, this all the way through. But the thing is, let's say you have a certain fraction of long virus particles. You get treated with a neuraminidase inhibitor. So now a bunch of long ones are released and they transmit. When they infect the next cell, they're going to make a mixture of long and short right. ones again. It's right. not like a... So I don't know that it really would matter clinically or even I biologically. I don't think it makes a matter. I don't think it has any impact. It may not. I agree. I, I, I think totally it's an artifact of the cell. I think it's period. an artifact of the system. It could very well I be. I agree. And I, would agree with I that think... Entirely. And, and I don't know I anything think, about biology. <laughs> no, I think that um, you get these long and sharp particles because, I don't know, you, you butt off too fast or you butt off too slow. I think that has nothing to do, that has nothing to do with any viral protein or anything. That's just. It a random be, yeah. mechanism of stuff. And I, mean, I think could be that a, to understand randomness, to associate bio, a biological aspect to randomness is not correct. So the I, I think you're right in that, for example, the um, escort pathway, which is taken to help budding, that could be inherently uh, flexible. It could make different sized particles, right? And this is just being reflected in the virus population. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how, I don't know how it knows, what the signal is for the escort to come and cleave some, the membrane, right? There has to be like, is it a size signal? Is it a weight signal? Is it, right. oh, you started you, this, we started this process four seconds ago. Yeah, so it's a I timing agree. signal. Exactly what? Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not sure that it's, I'm not sure that it actually, you know, you, I'm not sure that there it's actually controlled. Yeah, I, you might be right. I agree. I don't think we get a lot of conclusive evidence, but I do like the method. If you want to label a virus protein with a small insert that's not likely to be detrimental, I think this is a pretty cool way to do it. You might use it one day, Amy. Yeah, well, it, it would be helpful except for the fact that there's no protein inside the capsid of an entero, right? No, only on the and surface. And well, on the surface, VP, and I'm not VP4, sure. VP4, right? VP4 inside. But it's but but sometimes it's cleaved, sometimes it's not cleaved yeah. into an individual protein. But the structure is so is so organized that I don't know if you put this on, if you would perturb the structure so far that it would no longer bind to the receptor, or or if you wanted to study entry, it would form the pore properly to release the genome. Yeah. Yep. Right? I mean, I have. I have a lot of, I ha you, it would be hard, right? Yeah. To, because there's, there's, there's not a lot of wiggle room when you make such a rigor, uh, yeah, a structure with such rigor. So you get the Rigidity. best answers from the simplest questions. And I didn't see this as a simple question. No, it's a complicated question. I agree. So you're not going to get a simple answer. So uh, one of the uh, things that I couldn't figure out from this that interests me is uh, how many <clears throat> genomes per particle are there as a function of size. So you would want uh. to measure the ratio of HA or NA. I'm sorry, HA. Uh, to RNA. Uh, yeah, or t to NP maybe. So actually, um, no, so they did I that. think you would want to measure it with a uh, HA to a probe that could bind to a specific segment. So yeah. they use RNA, and I don't think that there's any correlation whatsoever to size and the number of of segments within the particle, or if some, or if all the large ones necessarily have duplicates of yeah. some of the segments. Yeah. I think that's right. I think they use NP as a surrogate for RNA. They they mentioned that. Right. And they did and as Amy said, they don't see more segments when the right. particles get longer. Yeah. Right. I'm not sure that NP is the right surrogate, right? 
but that's what they use. That's what they can do. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, as far as I can tell f- from this paper, from the other paper and some other discussions with some p- flu people, while there's a ca- theoretically a counting mechanism, goes awry mm-hmm. quite frequently. <laughs> okay. And, right. But I think it goes awry, isn't it a little bit more specific? Like you get more copies of like segment seven. You get more particles that have like multiple copies of segment seven than yeah. multiple copies of segment four. Yeah, you can put extra copies in it. It's not detrimental to a certain, as long as you don't exclude the right number of one to eight, right? You yeah. can put extra. Yeah, that's right. And I think that there might be some preference. They might. That might be biased slightly, but it might be our sampling that reveals that bias. So a a fishing expedition indeed. Well, you know, the thing is, Dixon, people get curious and they follow what their curiosity does. Yeah, but uh, you don't usually get funded for that. (laughs) Well, these these people have a grant. I don't know what it's to do, but they do have Uh, a grant. and Right. Uh, they have an R1, one. They have a flu R one. The, the guy has a uh, Chan Zuckerberg grant. I don't know what it's for, but you know you can do things that are not directly related to what you're funded for. True. No, no, no. Of course, that I think scientists are curious, curious people. So they see a, a phenomenon, and then they try to come up with a a system for explaining it. But I'm not sure that uh, the only thing they could explain with it is the title of the paper. No, I agree. I think we don't have answers, but I do. Th- I I was well. First of all, I, I was don't interested. think that the title of the paper is actually. I don't think that the title is good. Actually, uh, let's see. Uh, I I definitely do not like the term low fidelity. Low fidelity assembly promotes escape. Yeah, I don't like the title whatsoever. Yeah. I, I don't. I, 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 I don't think. I don't know what. So, like, when you think low fidelity, you think polymerase, right? Making yeah, a lot right. of errors. So, I don't think making a long particle is low fidelity necessarily, right? Right. I don't know. I don't. I don't understand the title. So, and what I is don't the think title? it promotes. I don't think. I don't think it promotes escape from cells. That suggests that there's an a, a selective advantage. And I don't think that there's a selective advantage. I think if they didn't use the right cell type that occurs in nature, that they're looking for trouble. I think it should have been done in, a, in an air-liquid interface. I agree. Then they may not have found anything. So, Well, yeah. they would have found filamentous particles. That's, what <laughs> That's a good point. Well, right. I think as yeah. we get more skilled at like Hans Snook's culture system and you can account for a negative pressure and stuff. You yeah. you can but you I can think that a lot of these That's things right. are I think trying to explain a stochastic thing as bio, as biologically significant is always iffy. It's hard, hard right? Yeah. It's very hard. Slippery yeah. slope. Yes. Um let's um but let's, I could be wrong. Let's do uh Let's do one email. I want Rich to do this one email <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> with the pictures. So, cause that, that'll take a while and, and Rich can give us his thoughts. So why don't you take that Rich? Okay. Yeah. This has been waiting here for a while. Rebecca writes, hello, Dr. Racaniello. I am an avid listener of your amazing podcast. After listening to your recent TWIV episode 832, I realized you might be interested in hearing about my smallpox vaccine adventure. A few years ago, I stopped at a garage sale of a retired nurse who had worked at Latterly Labs in Pearl River in the 50s and 60s. I was picking out some antique medical equipment and we started to talk. She then ran into her house and brought out (laughs) a framed collection of old glass syringes filled with various vaccine samples. One was labeled virus for smallpox prevention. And she's got uh, pictures here of all of this, which is uh, really something. Uh, she explained. There's an insert of a uh, that's link. I don't know. I don't know why that went in there. Okay, she explained 
that she had pulled this collection out of a dumpster at Letterly Labs in Pearl River during the 50s when they were renovating their buildings. It had been hanging on a wall in one of the Letterly's administrator's offices. She brought it home to hang on her wall where it had been ever since. She assured me that there was no risk of disease transmission. So, of course, I bought this very interesting piece of vaccine history as uh, to give as a graduation gift to my daughter who had just received her bachelor's degree in public health. Because of the sample labeled vaccine virus for smallpox prevention, we decided to call the CDC thinking that we needed to get some information from someone with a little more expertise before hanging it on a wall in our home. (laughs) The representative who answered the phone at the CDC was not particularly concerned. She nonchalantly suggested that if I would like, I could call my local public health department. The local public health department quickly called Albany, who sent a hazmat truck and two physician researchers to pick it up. And there's a they're part of the photo below. They loaded it into their hazmat truck, although as you can see from the photos, they handled it. They handled the frame samples without any protective gear. They drove it back to Albany, where they were instructed to have it destroyed. They were equally as disappointed as we were that the state decided to destroy all of the samples that were in this historical display, not just the samples labeled smallpox. And I should say, they weren't labeled smallpox, they were labeled smallpox vaccine. Big difference. From our understanding, the potential risk was derived from the fact that we didn't know which smallpox vaccine candidates were being developed by Letterly Labs, nor did we know the stage of vaccine production this liquid-filled pipette was from, so there was no way for us to know definitively what the pipette labeled vaccine for smallpox prevention actually contained. We would love to hear your perspective on the (laughs) fact uh, that this was thrown into a dumpster uh, uh, and what the actual risk could have been if this display had broken and its contents had spilled. Fast forward three years, and my daughter now has her master's degree in clinical <laughs> microbiology and infectious disease, Rebecca. Uh, and let me first uh, describe the part of this that says vaccine v- uh, virus for smallpox uh, prevention. I see uh, two... Uh, glass tubes that are uh, larger than capillary. They look like they're maybe a, a two, three millimeters in diameter. One of which looks to me like it contains a bifurcated needle that's uh, used to mm. uh, vaccinate people. And the other one contains some actual liquid, which to me is really important because uh, if there's any possibility that there's virus well, actually, it might have even been more important if it was <laughs> uh, lyophilized. It might survive better if it was lyophilized. At any rate, so this is the uh, greatest likelihood is that this is a sample of uh, vaccine virus or vaccinia virus, not smallpox, but vaccinia virus, the virus that's used to vaccinate people, uh, and uh, a needle which would be used to administer the vaccination. Mm. So, well, it just says vaccine virus for smallpox prevention. It doesn't say right. anything about being p- smallpox. Right, exactly, exactly. And that's the problem is that people trip over the word smallpox, okay, when in fact there's probably no smallpox anywhere near this. Uh, so she'd like to hear my uh, our perspective on the fact that it was thrown into a dumpster, and I will tell you that it makes me want to cry, okay, uh, and I will tell you, among other things, why. And I'm gonna, uh, uh, I'm going to do my pick in advance, okay? Because this would be my pick of the week for this, uh, for this episode. And this is an article by uh, Jose Esparza. It's not an article; it's a letter by Jose uh, to the journal Vaccine, by Jose Esparza and Clarissa Damaso from January of this year called Searching for the Origin of the Smallpox Vaccine, Edward Jenner and His Little-Known Horsepox Hypothesis. So as we've discussed on the show several times before, the actual origins of the virus that has been used to vaccinate people against smallpox is somewhat 
obscure. Because if you take that virus, now called vaccinia, and compare it to almost anything in nature, um, it's unique. Okay, the closest thing you can find is something called horsepox, uh, of which there's only one sample uh, uh, from a single horse in Mongolia. Horsepox is thought of as a disease that probably was much more prevalent in Jenner's time and has since gone extinct. And we have just one sample that we call horsepox. Whether that's the same as what was circulating in Jenner's time, uh, we don't really know. Now, the, myth, the mythology, it's not really mythology, it's documented, is that vaccinia was derived from cow, cowpox because milkmaids picked up uh, cowpox, that is lesions on their hands from milking cows. Uh, and uh, if you transmitted that material artificially to somebody in their skin, you conferred immunity to smallpox. And so this became the, the idea was that this was actually cowpox. And I think you can immunize somebody against smallpox with something that's genuinely cowpox. But if you look at what we now call cowpox and what we call vaccinia, they're uh, clearly quite different. So the question becomes, what is it, in fact, that Jenner was working with? And um, what is it that, uh, you know, what was the evolution of uh, viruses that were used for vaccination? And in fact, Jose... And Clarissa, both of them, and some others as well, have been investigating this for some period of time by looking at archival samples of vaccines. And the, the classic that we've actually discussed was Jose got some old historical samples from some old vaccine company on eBay, for crying out loud. And he's <laughs> got uh, pictures of this stuff. And they got dna out of it and and sequence the dna and there are a lot of these that are a lot closer to what we know as horsepox than they are to cowpox what this letter concerns in fact is going back to jenner's original publication which was his what's called his inquiry he had to publish his uh studies on his own right he actually wrote this up into a a fairly substantial publication and had it printed and distributed himself yeah and we, it's been uh, we, all over the place. Mm-hmm. We had uh, we had an episode where we actually went over Jenner's inquiry, and I think that may have been just Alan and myself. I'm not sure. I'll look it uh-huh. up uh, and and come back with it. With beautiful and pictures. I recall in that episode because I read the inquiry. I think I had read it before, but I read it again for that episode. And there are these comments in it that I couldn't quite figure out because Jenner talked about this disease in horses called grease which was a blistering disease that happened around their hooves, okay? And about how he thought that maybe you could get material that would work uh, against smallpox from those lesions. And he thought the cows were actually picking up this same stuff from the horses, okay? Though he's a little a little confusing on this subject, and it's a little vague, so he doesn't really, really nail it down. But what you come away with is that Jenner was thinking that maybe the stuff that worked best in vaccination was stuff that originated in horses and had been cycled through cows, okay? Mm. And now you could use that to vaccinate people. But there's a strong indication, at least, if you read between the lines or even read the lines themselves in the Jenner article, that it wasn't necessarily cowpox alone or even cowpox at all that was active in his vaccination, but Mm. horsepox or something that came. Of course, Jenner didn't even know if they were the same or different things. Okay, Mm. all he knew, he didn't know anything about viruses. These were just blistering diseases, okay? But if you look back at the inquiry and you look at the archival samples that these guys have been looking at, uh, it it becomes... uh, uh, more and more suspicious that the origins of vaccinia were, in fact, horsepox, mm-hmm. not cowpox. How do you figure this out? You take that thing they dumped in the dumpster and, <laughs> and you get some of that stuff out and sequence it. And what would even be better is if you could actually grow something out of it. All mm-hmm. right. And sure, you might want to take precautions with this. I'm sorry the CDC didn't jump on it. I'd be interested to know who they talked to because there's got to be somebody poxy at the CDC who would say, ooh, ooh, 
send this isn't, to me. Uh, isn't that and we'll anger? We'll take it in our BSL four, and we'll see if we can grow something out of it, and we'll sequence something out of it. We'll be careful with it to start with. Okay, yeah. though it was but, probably harmless. Wouldn't that so be uh, Inger Damon who would do that? Uh, it would have been. Inger, I think, has been kicked upstairs and does all kinds of other stuff. But certainly she would be a resource. I don't I don't know that she's necessarily uh, the the person, uh, the the go to person. Well, yeah. she would she would be my go to. Yes. I would contact Inger and say, I've got this stuff. Uh, can you guys have a look at it? And she would if she didn't do it herself, she would know who to send it to. So to make this vaccine in the old days, in Jenner's time, they would have to isolate this pox virus, whichever one it was, periodically. Isn't there a record of which animal they used? Um, uh, I'm not an expert on this. Uh, I, and uh, uh, both Jose and Clarissa have written uh, reviews of this. And someday down the road, we're going to come back and study this again in much more detail. But I do think that there are records that indicate that over time, material from both cows and horses was used. Okay. Got it. There is, there's, matter of fact, documented, I think, uh, um, uh, circumstances of what they called equination. <laughs> okay. Good. As opposed to vaccination. vaccination. Okay. So I did a little search and I found at the National Museum of American History, there's an, a little exhibit, small palm vaccine, avianized from Letterly. It's a couple of vials Avian. that look just like this. And it is um, from 1975, vaccinia virus of chick embryo origin. And that's it. Looks exactly the same. Let me put the link in the show notes. So I think basically this is uh, CDC said. You know, we have tons of this stuff. Um, we Maybe. don't need any more. It looks like the same vials. Of course, you don't know if it's the same virus, but it looks like there's a bifurcated needle there, and there's also some vials. Um, if you if you go to that link, I mean, it must be all over the place because we eliminated the disease from the entire earth. So that there must be but lots suspect, of leftovers. I I suspect that they saw the word smallpox and say we're not taking any chances and we're not going to exactly, exactly we're not going to put it in a BSL four and open it carefully and sequence right, it. Right, this, right, 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 right. We're not going to do that. It's too bad. But take a look at that, Rich. Okay. I think it's the same vial that that, that was in that thing. So it's just vaccinia yeah. virus. So all right. Well, that, that's your pick as well. That's good. We, do, we have to get Clarissa on someday to talk about this whole story, right? Yes, sure. Uh, so here's an episode, TWIV 124, Viruses That Make You Better. <laughs> uh, I think that was with oh, Grant. No, 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 no. That's not the one with, yeah, that's not the one with Grant. I'll keep looking while you guys are discussing and see All if right. I can find this uh, episode where we um, did Jenner's inquiry. Okay, Dixon, what do you have for us today? I have a twosome. You, sometimes you guys do twosome, so I did a twosome today. Um, I've been fascinated with the James Webb Space Telescope, as you know, from start to finish. And it hasn't finished, of course, but they're, they are now in the position – of saying that all 18 panels that compose the mirror that collects the light that will tell us the age of the universe is now in perfect focus. They have focused on an ordinary star. The star has a number. They don't even have a name for this star. And it gave exactly hmm. the <laughs> configuration that you should expect if they, all of the mirrors matched where they should be, and they did. So this is not going to be a Hubble Space Telescope odyssey. This is going to be a remarkable instrument that will now give us insight as to whether or not various size polio and um, influenza particles can actually infect different – no, that's, that, that was a different topic. I'm sorry. Um, we will learn a lot about where we all came from based on this uh, remarkable instrument that we have put into outer space. And the second pick I have, which is a more um, feel-good uh, pick, th this is a feel-good pick too, by the way, um, is a nature photo contest by um, the Nature Conservatory 
in the nature concern. Yeah, that's right. The the the, the organization that buys up uh, land and then returns it to wild, and uh, they they have a photo contest every year. This is a remarkable collection of of photographs. I, I was absolutely stunned when I looked through them. Dixon. and I've picked these before, but these are fantastic. So this image, Dixon, is amazing. It's just so sharp. But if you look in, if you blow into it, you blow it up. There are all these little things that look like solar systems in the background. Is that what they are? <laughs> yes. No, no, they're other stars. They're just other stars. They might have hit galaxies too, but I think there's, they just said there's a scattering of stars that they could see in the background. And that was the added proof that they had uh, the same perfect focus. It's within the, 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 they have to be within a range that's smaller than the diameter of a human hair to say that they're perfectly aligned. And you've got 18 of these things to come into alignment, and okay. they, it worked perfectly. Because they look like solar systems to me. That's why I asked. Well, they might, they might, you know. Because the solar system to, has at its center a star, right? The sun. Yeah, that's correct. So we'd have to blow those up to see. And that, yeah. they're going to use this to look for planets around other suns. That's right. That's cool. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Amy, what do, you, pictures. what do you have for us today? So Catherine Wu in The Atlantic wrote a, an article. Um, so now that we are decided that the pandemic is almost over, it's time to like think about how to prepare for the next one. And um, so the VRC uh, is, so they have a program called Premise, which is supposed to be you're supposed to survey people and then look for antibodies in their blood. And while well, they claim it's not a Sarah survey because you aren't, so it's kind of a mixed thing about whether or not it's a Sarah survey because the idea is to take these antibodies and identi is to generate them as monoclonal therapy so that you're protected for what's circulating around. So therefore, you're taking it as a marker of previous infection. And it's kind of flawed also because it's based off of this idea that one, that antibody is specific to that pathogen and that antibodies are the only thing that's important. And so um, you guys can think about whether or not this is really a good plan. Um, didn't right? someone tell her that T cells are important too? Well, it's really kind of glossed over. It's also kind of glossed over, although she does make a few statements about whether or not these, about whether or not we know anything about correlatives of protection and if antibodies are correlatives of protection. And uh, a certain scientist is also cited in the paper as saying antibodies are as close a correlative, you know, it's close enough to being a correlative of protection. And I'm not sure I would agree with that individual. And, um, I think like there's a lot of, uh, you're, I think that there's a large leap of faith in, in doing something like this and using it as a pandemic potential or pandemic preparedness program. Yeah. Well, and based I on think, your paper, I think it totally is wrong. Right. <laughs> and, but I also think like for, for hundred, for 50 years, we've, given the polio vaccine and uh, talking to someone who spent his entire career studying polio and spending my time with somebody else who spent his entire time thinking about polio. I'm not sure that either one of you would say we understand the correlatives of protection against polio. I think you ought to send Karen, Catherine Wu your article and say it's not as simple as they make you think. Yeah, so that could be part. I mean, I already sent my article to somebody who propagated, who continues to propagate the idea that we can use sero surveys to understand uh, who's been infected with EVD68 and got no response. So maybe, I don't know. Well, I think I'll you think also that. sent your article to one of the people quoted in this article who said, eh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> I, I, I did send it to them. I also, yeah, I also sent it to somebody in Europe who also said, eh, I don't really believe your data. But hey, everybody's in, you know. Catherine Remember, Wu. science is not a belief system. Remember that. Yeah, I just think that she missed completely on this article. 
And she, normally uh, she's very good, but I think that this is a, a complete miss in some respects. She has a 2018 PhD in microbiology from Harvard. Yeah, she studied tuberculosis. Yeah, well, you don't always get it right. I agree. Right. That she's I mean, good. I mean, here are some of the quotes. You know, uh, she talks to John Wary, the immunologist, and he says, "Monitoring the status of our anti-disease protection would amount to a kind of immune surveillance." that could tell us when immunity wanes and what needs to be augmented. One obvious start is to one obvious place to start is mass antibody testing or serology. So it sounds like it's a fancy euphemism. You're 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 circumventing using the word ser- sero survey because you absolutely don't want to use it, but it's a fancy sero survey to figure out how dramatic and quickly antibody levels are changing over time and in whom we could get a rough sense of which members of the population might be most susceptible in the event of another surge or prioritize them for boosters, tests, treatments, and more. A strategy like this could act as an immunological fuel gauge, sounding alarm before our antibody tanks are empty. So again, only thing that matters in protection is antibodies. So can I ask you a question, Amy? Tell me how this relates. So- Omicron comes along and people who've been vaccinated, their sera doesn't neutralize it anymore, yet they're protected against severe disease. So how does that tell you that antibodies are a correlative protection again? Can you remind me? Uh, it's not my work, so I can't I can't okay. explain All the right. logic so the behind that study. To the wrong person. Yeah, I was going to say. I mean, here here's here's the the so the guy who's in charge of the study. This is what he says. So he says the goal is to track antibodies by two metrics: durability, or the length that the molecules stay acceptably high, and breadth, or the degree which which they zap different variants. Yeah. Oh. Well, I, I just think this is not right. I mean, the thing is, it's based on influenza, right? Because no, for it's based flu, off of SARS-CoV-2. It's based off of basically SARS-CoV-2. Because well, for we, flu, they look at the hemagglutinating inhibition titers in serum, and right. they can tell when they drop below a certain level, that is going to portend an increase in severe disease. That right. is a good correlation. But there's no such correlation as far as I can see for for SARS-CoV-2. Based on that Omicron story no, that I just told there's you. not. And there wasn't for SARS-1. I mean, it could be non-neutralizing antibodies. It could be T cells. It could be NK cells. Who knows? Right. But if they're they just got gonna, it something. Yeah, it's something there. But the, the serial survey is not going to pick it up. Oh, well. Right. And so, as I said, this is... You know, she, she has a paragraph that says, the CDC and equivalent agents... Are, Agencies abroad have built up systems to scope out antibodies in the community before, including the coronavirus pandemic. Those surveys have been primarily used antibodies as a proxy for post for past infection. Mm. So by right there, it's a sera survey. I agree. Yeah. And you can circumvent it all you want, but what you're saying is what well, you have these antibodies. So even if I don't know exactly what what virus you have, I know you've been exposed to something we've not seen before. And so we're going to pure we're going to say that we're going to purify those antibodies and then we're going to use them as a therapy. That's basically how this is supposed to work. Mm. Okay. Good good use of NIH money. <laughs> All right. I, I'm not debating that. I just think that if you're an, a journalist, this you should be you should have presented the whole story about why this may not be the appropriate plan and the caveats to the fact that you've based this solely on antibodies and stuff. Well, but this is what 
the people she spoke with. Okay, that's what they told her. So she's got an in with Akiko, right? So she calls her about every immunology story. Well, then, yeah, I mean, Akiko is one of the people who's 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 right. who's quoted, and it's her quote that says antibodies are the correlative of yeah. protection and against SARS-CoV-2. Dueck is heading this program, so she talks to him. So she gets the, the corporate line, and she doesn't get the caveats from Amy, which well, she should. Well, you don't have to talk to me. Just, I mean, you don't have to talk to me particularly. There's, I mean, there are caveats. Any, you know. Yeah. I mean, I this know. all assumes that every antibody is also specific, that there's no cross-reactivity. Yes. But I think that's the, the biggest thing here is, is that your work shows at least for antiviruses, and most likely for many, that's not the case, and it's ignored. But you're going to have to um, be vocal over the next ten years. <laughs> okay, not a problem. My pick <laughs> is a YouTube channel called Black Tail Studio. So uh, I've been watching this guy. He's got over a million and a half subscribers. He is a woodworker out in the Portland area. And what he does is make high-end stuff for wealthy people or people that want to spend $15,000 on a wood countertop for their kitchen. He gets really big pieces of wood. He goes and buys them. And then he makes them into things. And like he's got one video here, the $15,000 kitchen island and so, and That's he not said, so expensive. That's not so expensive. Well, I would never spend that on wood because as soon as you put a hot thing on it, it's going to burn it and you're going to ruin That's it. That's true. That is. I'd rather true. have granite, but. All I could say is, true. didn't this table look very similar to one at Ian yeah. yesterday? <laughs> so then yesterday, Amy and I went to hear Ian Lipkin talk and his conference table and also in his office, he, <laughs> he did that. He went and bought wood in Brooklyn. And had a guy yeah, make his tables from it. And it's the same thing. And, yeah. you know, these pieces of wood. And the fascinating thing is to watch one of, one of these where he shows you what he does. They're called river tables. So they're where the bark is often. You have to cut that out and fill it in with epoxy. And, this, and the guy right. shows you how to do that. And then when there are cracks, you have to put these bow tie pieces of wood in. You cut That's a piece true. of wood in a bow tie. And Dixon, you're a woodworker. You know all about this. And then you well, sink it in and you glue it. And... Yep. Um, he he bought this four thousand dollar piece of wood, which he made into a um, uh, a thing over the fireplace, a mantle, right? A mantle. And he no, had the bow ties at either end. And someone wrote a comment: if if you put bow ties in mine, I would never buy it from you with a bow tie in it. But really? but Ian's table had was full of bow ties. That's what you have to do. It's really interesting. He shows you how he he turns it over, and these are huge pieces. You know, when he picks they them are, up and flips beautiful. them, they could break in half if he's not careful. That's true. Uh, so anyway, I watched the whole video. They're just amazing. It's amazing. He, he's a very he's, good woodworker. He's got amazing tools. And a great helicopter pilot also. <laughs> and he's got a lot. Of, he said, and this is the cool thing. He said, you know, I'm a high-end provider, but I make most of my money these days from YouTube. That's right. <laughs> but his he, wife had to show him how to use it. He, yeah, but he just takes videos of him working. He sets up cameras and he runs them. Then that's he edits, right. And people love watching it because, oh, like I said, it's, it's a craftsman. It's a really good craftsman. Yeah, it's, um, it's wonderful work. He does wonderful work. Yeah. So are we pur are we purchasing one of these tables like No, you? no, 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 no. I, I don't need a countertop. I'm good. Okay. And so I'm there's not, a wonderful woodworker in Pennsylvania He's Japanese, and I'm blocking on his name. It's like Kawasaki, but it's not Kawasaki. And he, he does all of his tables. He's now dead, uh, but he's, his business is carrying on. And they use all walnut trees that are diseased or that are about to be cut down because they've outlived their function. And he made amazing tables by leaving the rough edges where the bark was. Yeah, yeah. And he almost single-handedly invented that bow tie the way of uh, melding two pieces ah. of wood together. Mm. And that's his signature. And he, a lot of his furniture comes up on the Antique Roadshow because people want to know how much it improved in value since they bought it. And, and the price of the item is usually on a, a tag underneath the table. So you can actually tell mm. when it was constructed. And the prices have gone crazy. 
just absolutely crazy. So there are a lot of people out there that will buy a table with a bow tie in it. I can tell you that. You know, when we were <laughs> furnishing the incubator, I said, Amy, should we get should we get tables like Ian's in his office? She said, no, <laughs> you don't want that look. And I, yeah, I don't you, really, want, you, you want Shalansky's office. He I don't know what his chairman. office. Was. He he had shaker furniture, and they were it was exquisite. He had an, an entire yeah. office made out of shaker furniture that was just wonderful. Well, I didn't I didn't know what his office. But, uh, was like. You know, we have a, great. Uh, you can't see my table here, but I have a ninety six nice table inch solid. What is it? Oak or something, Amy? I don't remember. Yeah, it's solid oak. It's very nice. Um, and you have a nice studio. It's a nice, yeah. But what nice. I thought about more was you. I thought I watched Vincent Racaniello evolve from a professor of virology to a mentor of graduate students to a an aficionado of podcasting, and now you're going to become a pod, you're a permanent podcaster. And I, I saw a lot of parallels in the life of this guy and yours. And you might have subconsciously picked it maybe for that reason. Because maybe. once you find your passion, it doesn't even matter if you can make money at it. This guy said he doesn't care if he could make money at this or not. He wanted to do it. And he found a way to do it. And I think that takes a lot of courage. And uh, this guy spent a lot of money. Remember he said he spent $70,000 on a helicopter, um, uh, you know, uh, pilot license license. Uh, what am I trying to say? You know, the learning how lessons, to lessons, lessons, yeah. lessons. Yeah. And he became an expert at helicoptering and he had a great life and he loved his venues and everything else. But once he discovered woodworking and that probably came to him in a dream because hmm. he had never done it before. He said, oh, I know exactly what I want to do. And, and you can see his passion. You can, you can feel his <laughs> expressivity in the, the work that he's produced and they're, Beautiful, beautiful pieces. Yeah, they're of very nice. No, I think it's cool that. I mean, I it's like. It's a great pick. It's a great when pick. people do things like this, and I've picked a few of them: painters and furniture yeah, refinishers. Yeah, yeah, I like right. that they film themselves and they put it on YouTube because I get to learn, and I don't want to do this, sure. but I just like seeing it. Um, and Understood. I have another pick for next time of, of some other aspect too. But I, no, I find this fascinating. Pick. I do appreciate craft, right? Yes, yes. Now, you Dixon, do. you're. You make wonderful mats and frames, right? That's what you do these days. Yeah, I like doing that. I um, like doing and that. But he's has really a, a tie fly, a, a fly tire. A tie flyer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, the thingy for Never the fish. That. But I, I consider myself a, um, a dilettante, basically, because I've flip-flopped between watercolor painting and photography and fly tying. <laughs> you know, I like anything that expresses creativity. Plus and he it, cooks. That's why I loved. I loved, I loved no, your your watercolors. I love. I think they're wonderful. Well, well thank you. But I, I loved cooking, and like Amy was just about to say, but I loved lab work because I looked at that like cooking mm. that you don't eat. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, <yes. laughs> at least you better not. <laughs> Indeed. All right. Uh, we have a listener pick from Richard Martin Chaplin's website on the science of water. Over five thousand references and has been online since the wow. year two thousand. He has apparently nearly single-handedly assembled an encyclopedia on the biological and physical understandings of water. This includes a trove of summaries with numerous references on the hydration of biological molecules, nucleic acids, proteins, lipid, and how water plays many roles in biological systems. One piece of information that I was unaware of was the molecular effects of Antifreeze proteins that prevent crystallization oh, sure. of water in organisms sure. like fish that live in cold water environments. In any case, don't forget the role water plays. You are around 50 to 65%. Proteins and RNA are cool, but water is too. You're not just a strolling skeleton attached to flesh containing little protein nucleic acid lipid bags inside them. Many of those bags have an average 70 to 70 Five percent water content. We are really aqua people from the oceans. In any case, check out the table of contents of Martin's site, and I hope you have hours to read about water since it's fascinating. Richard. Thank you, Richard. That's very cool. That water is cool stuff, and I like to drink water, too. Indeed. It's lovely. That will do it for TWIV number 878. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIV. You can send your questions, comments, pick 
twiv at microbe.tv. And if you would like to support our work, you can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. We are a 501c3, so your contributions are tax deductible. Dixon de Palmiers at trichinella.org, the living river.org. Thank you, Dixon. Thank you, Vincent, for um, creating this never ending story. It's a never ending story. Every time we have heated discussions about the meaning of life at the virus level, um, it elicits a tremendously um, isotropic radiation of ideas. And uh, I love being part of this. So I hope I can stay part of this for the rest of my natural life. Thank yeah, you. it's, I cannot do it without you guys. It is a conversation, right? That's, Indeed. I think when we talk, that's when the cool parts come out because we each have different perspectives and different passions. viewpoints, right? Different passions, and that's right. When I couldn't figure something out, you can, right? Or someone else. So that's well, why I think conversations are a wonderful teaching. It's good stuff. It's good experience. stuff. Rich Condit is at the University of Florida Gaines. He's an emeritus professor at the University of Florida Gainesville. He's currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Uh, always a good time. Um, I uh, want to uh, just very briefly elaborate because I've been doing a little research here. <laughs> 12170 is called From Virialis Effluvia to VLPs. And that had, as I re uh, recalled correctly, uh, um, it was a, uh, what do we call it? An invincible twiv? Oh, right. Without me. Uh, <laughs> it was uh, Alan Dove, me, and Dixon. And right. that's the uh, episode where we went over Jenner's inquiry. And right. I have to listen to it again because, as I remember, we stumbled over this thing about what's the role of horses because I'd noticed it and it wasn't making a lot of sense to me. And the other is Twiv 478, a pox on your horse, uh, <laughs> where that had uh, uh, Vincent, Dixon, Alan, me, and Kathy. And we discussed this paper where um, Dave Evans Lab uh, synthesized uh, horse pox from a chemically synthesized DNA. That made a flap a while ago. But yeah, as right, part right. of that discussion, we talked about the origins of the vaccine. And so that that has all the that stuff that I talked about in there. And we will talk about this more in the future. At any rate, always a good time. So the that work was done in Dave Evans' lab. It's in Edmonton, right? Yes. And his postdoc or student, I can't remember his name, but he was on a TWIV that we recorded in Nova Scotia when Alan and I went up there for a oh, meeting. Okay. And he was on the TWIV and he talked a little bit about that as well. Yeah. Amy Rosenfeld is at Columbia University Irving Medical Center and enterovirus.net. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.